is involved with, but their job is to help you get that experience, help you connect to the other personnel at the agency who do work with that stuff. And maybe you can spend a half day showing you around, and maybe can meet with you to go over a department budget and how it works. That's stuff that you're going to need for class, you'll see in your syllabi, and so your field instructor responsibility is to help connect you to those, those people and those resources. Regular supervision, it's like the third time I've said it, three minutes, it's kind of important. Um, and ongoing feedback. Because you're having regular supervision, and you would think that this is natural, and I don't mind telling you from a student perspective and from a professional perspective, it's not natural for everyone. You would think that meeting every week in an organized way, someone would tell you if you're doing very well, or doing poor, or struggling in this area. And some people are really good about communicating that information. And some people are just not really good about communicating that information. And you get to the end of the semester and they do an evaluation and you get all these like, needs improvement, needs improvement, needs improvement. You're like, why didn't you say that before? So, you know, ask the question. Even though this is listed as a field instructor responsibility, by you with ongoing feedback, you share that responsibility. Ask how you're doing on certain tasks. Do you have concerns about your field receptors? Mm -hmm. I guess the perception of what we as faculty students are, I guess, our supposed to do. Yeah. I would talk to the field instructor first. I mean, they're assigning you to the preceptor. So part of their duties is actually to make sure the preceptor understands. So if you feel the preceptor is either asking too much or too little or just not understanding what you're supposed to be doing, okay. <laughs> go to the field instructor first and say these are my concerns. That's something the field instructor should address. Oftentimes, um, some of these meetings, when you're talking about your learning contract, you're talking, might be all three of you together. When you're identifying the learning contract, that, that can be all three. You know, that would be all three of you together. Portions of your supervision could be all three of you together. Because if I'm going to ask about like a specific project you're working on with the psychologist, well, I need the psychologist involved in that feedback. So portions of that should involve the perception. If you have those concerns or you've gotten that feedback or you know, go to your field instructor and have those discussions. Field instructor, preceptors are not tied to you for the whole year. The field instructor is hopefully tied to you for the whole year. But the preceptor might change whether it's a switch jobs or you know they had a project that only took a month. You were there for a the month. Now you're back with your field instructor and, and second semester kind of send you out to someone else because of a special project that, can, that is social work oriented, that is being managed by a psychologist, let's say. So the preceptor might change. Uh, review notes, field instructor is still doing this. All those notes you write, they get them, they get to see them. <laughs> Supervision notes are very useful for a couple of reasons. Uh, I've got this one. Most of the stories I'm going to steal, but I used to do it when I was a field instructor too. I, you know, we met, we had supervision. I'm going to ask you to document in a note our session, and you're going to send that note back to me. Now, it works on your documentation skills, but it also lets me know what you got out of the session. If we were on the same page, or if you're, you got a bunch of stuff out of the session that I didn't know we talked about. Or if I tried to talk to you about some things, but evidently I didn't do that very well. I need that. And so that's a useful piece of supervision notes. The question in the back. Yeah. Um, were you saying that, um, I'm kind of backing up here, but were you saying that you will receive additional assignments from the liaison beyond our contract with our field instructor? Um, not additional assignments. No. Like when you gave the example of the like going and finding out the financials and then the field instructor. Those are classroom assignments. Oh, okay. uh, different classes that you have that actually require you to go to your field placement to get the resources needed to complete the assignments. Okay, okay. I got you. And so that so we wouldn't count any of that as a real time review. 
If you do it at field, it's part of your field time. When you tell, like, like find out, let me give you an example, like the agency budget, or the program budget for the program you work in. And I talk to my field instructor, this is what I have to do. They arrange for me to meet with so-and-so in, in the finance department. That's all part of my field time. It's being done at field. It's all part of your time there that you're collecting the information, even though you're going to end up writing a paper and giving it to your teacher for seven out of the 32 or something like that. Yeah. I would just add that that does not mean you have permission to do class work in the field. Uh, you, you need to talk about that with your field instructor to determine what is appropriate. Um, I think we give that decision and authority to your field instructor. There will be some projects that you will work on. Y'all can hear me. Y'all need to be fine. Mm -mm. um, you will have some of uh, they're fine with some are fine with it, but sometimes there have been situations where they feel like that has been abused. So I would encourage you to have a discussion about it with your field instructor, instructor, make a list of what you want to make sure you do as part of rapport building. And one of them should be a question you have around assignments that are field related and whether you can do that work at the placement or not. Just because it gives them the control back, anytime you give control back and you don't assume, it makes for it, it fosters a more positive rapport, I think, with the field instructor. A lot of times they're going to say exactly what Mike's telling you. Yes, you can do assignments related to field at field, but you need, you need you to give them time. the courtesy first. And it's a time thing with your field instructor because they have things for you to do as well. And they'll build that in as a thing to do. Right. And that's not writing the paper, that's accessing the resource to get information. Would you not like your field? Let me let me come back to that in a bit. Let me come back to that one. Um, yes. Regarding the field notes, is there going to be a section where you're trying to talk about field notes? I don't see how the agenda of the field notes talk under supervision, right? When we have a discussion about supervision, we'll discuss the notes. There is a formatted note.
little bit of a distribution process. But so the way some changes occur, we share with all the liaisons and they share with all the students and the other stuff. They conduct the visits, as we said, October and March, other times as needed. They consult with you and the field instructor about your progress, about your learning patterns, any kind of possible problems, anything pertinent to your field education experience. They discuss the learning contract, as we said. Um, one other thing that we'll say about that discussion, when a field liaison comes in, they should be coming in to meet with you and your field instructor. Precept also is there is a precept. They should not be coming and they're going to meet with your field instructor for a half hour first, and then all three of you, and then they leave. I mean, if there's a process, a half hour one on one with the field instructor, or a half hour one on one with you, and then a half hour all three of you together, that's okay. The liaison will explain that to you in the beginning talk to you and the field instructor. This is how I like to meet with everyone. And make sure everyone's good with that plan and then follow through. But there should not be any private meetings. This is about your experience. Everyone should be at the table at the same time to have that discussion. Was there a question? Yes. Um, this is regarding page 48, field liaison. I guess it pertains to Charleston and Greenville students, but it says we have to reimburse the field liaison for traveling to Charleston. What is that about? How much is that? In those areas, like <laughs> Charleston. Well, I, I think in those areas are probably something that went that mile yeah. anyway. It, it, everybody's here, we would have an individual discussion about it. Sometimes people have re re request us to find them a placement that is beyond. It's like 150 miles. Like in Tennessee. Because they want to go do tennis there for the summer or something. So we're not going to do that or coordinate something beyond our needs like that. You would pay for that if it was something beyond. I don't think anybody in here, uh, actually since I've been director for education, I don't think we've ever made anybody reimbursed. Um, or we've had that discussion about what would be reimbursed if they wanted something outside the scope of normal practice. So I wouldn't worry about that. And the other aspect to it, your field liaisons are, to the best of our ability, our private honors ability, uh, they're kind of geographically located. But there's a field liaison who lives and is based out of the Charleston area. And so that liaison is working with Charleston students. And there's one that, you know, in the upstate. And so that liaison is working with those students. And obviously here in Columbia, there's so. several. But we try to do that precisely to cut down on those travel costs, but also to make the liaison, liaison a little more available to you. Uh, last year, I had students who uh, were at Myrtle Beach really hard when they call you at 9 30 and like we really need you to come here now it's an emergency like that's a really long way all right <laughs> so and so we try to make them more available to everyone field instructors and to you and kind of make and it's all it's just easier i mean as a liaison i love going and seeing trainings that students are presenting i know that's right my has done it also it's just it's just neat any other questions about that? Speaker. I have two questions. Um, so there's the, the field liaison, which is at the College of Social Work. Have those been assigned and we just don't know them yet? Almost completely, yes. <coughs> I'll tell you where we are in the Y'all are, are ahead of us, and that's okay. That's a good question to ask. And if I were in your shoes, I'd want to know that too. Um, field liaisons have been matched. And we have set, we're in the process, we're having this training. I actually have them already done, but we haven't had a chance to get them out to the field liaisons. I plan to send them out on Friday. And what I'll do is I'll give them a kickstart. In other words, I've asked them to contact you, so I want to give them time to be able to contact you before I give y'all the assignments. Um, but those will be sent out. So they've pretty much already been matched up. In fact, if I've talked with some of you today, I've already told you who your liaison might be, if I can remember it. Um, you know, we have Mike who does 45, I usually manage around 20, Jennifer serves as a liaison for 12, and then we have a full-time person named Lana Cook who actually is going to have between 90 and 100. Um, we have uh, in Charleston, Debbie Kernis is a field liaison, Tammy Bryant's a field liaison, and Ed Ledford is a field liaison, just to kind of hear some names. In Greenville, we have Elsie Rome and Joe Campbell. 
and then we have about 10 here. We have over 500 placements. So that's a lot. That's, we do external, I manage a lot of employees and their role is field liaison too. So we actually just had our training for our field liaisons last Wednesday. And so they're up in par and ready to go. And you'll, you should expect your liaison assignment. You probably won't get it to the end of block week or that week after. Um, but your field instructors are well aware when they're going to get it. So they know that they aren't going to get it for a couple more weeks. And the same for the liaison. The reason we have to wait so late to identify is because we still have, what, 30 students to place or in the process of transition with. And I don't like to do assignments until the majority of folks are placed because I like to group them based on geographic area because it prevents people from having to pay for travel. And it just makes more sense budgetary-wise. If I'm a liaison, I'd rather know, since some people can only work with 15 students, I have to know how many are going to be at Lexington Medical Center before I can do application. So if there's some people who are still in process and not finalized, you kind of have to wait till it's all done. So there you go. you got an idea about employee management. <laughs> you got a good schedule how it goes, but, but that should answer your question make you feel, feel maybe a little bit more confident. I might remember who your liaison is if y'all want to ask me a break. I might know off the top of my head since I just finished it up this week. While you have the microphone, Dr. Uh -huh. um, so the, the field instructor, that's the person who you're working directly under? That is correct. The preceptor, is that a separate individual or is That is a really good question. You know, last year I did a physical demonstration because this is, this confuses most people when they come in. It's kind of like, where do you work? Do you have you worked? I'm at you're at PNA? Oh, that's awesome. Okay, so if you're at PNA, who's your supervisor? Uh, Brenda. Okay, so Brenda, we had somebody else who's working with Brenda. So y'all need to find each other. Um, you know, Brenda's an MSW, so you won't probably have a task supervisor. Okay. Uh, Brenda has an MSW from New York, and she's been out for a while. Um, but say uh, Brenda has you and two other students, and that student wants to do a lot of work on information intake and referral. And so she lets a student, you, uh, Brenda lets a student work there in that area um, a day a week and that person happens to not have a social work degree. Uh, so they have a bachelor in psychology or a BSW or some other degree. They're considered a preceptor because they're working with you kind of responsible for day-to-day -day, training you on in information intake. It's a way to involve and identify and recognize um, the people that you're going to be working with as a part of your educational experience. Um, and they're an important person to identify and distinguish, which uh, is, cannot be said enough because they are not a professional social worker. That's not knocking them. I'm sure that they are well, but the social work comes with a code of ethics. We have a different lens and glasses that we put on and how we're supposed to internalize things. And so this is why you need that MSW field insurance. The important thing is for you to be able to differentiate between the two. But never call a preceptor a non-social worker. Okay, because that wouldn't be respectful language. <laughs> but that would be the main difference. You know, your field instructor is one you go to and say, gosh, not, this feels icky, let's process this. You would, I wouldn't encourage you to do that with your task supervisor because they don't have a code to go by uh, that advises them about how to do things. Yes? Okay. It's like a double layer of MSW. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was going to comment on that. Sometimes you're a field preceptor if you have one, and not everyone will have one. Right. Is also an MSW. Two years plus. Qualifies. But they're your preceptor because they're your preceptor because your field instructor also is the one who agreed to do all this paperwork, came to our training, has been trained, is the one that's responsible for your learning contract. You know, so there's, there's a difference in the duties they bring on as well. Yeah, and I would say I served as a preceptor too. I was at PNA, um, and I actually served as a preceptor my first year out of my MSW degree uh, for the first two years. But the different what the difference was, I wasn't. I mean, it takes a while to really uh, be able to provide for a student in that level of supervisory sense. You know, I think there's a two-year post council on social work education requirement, and so that's the main reason why there's a difference. But the other real reason is, you know, you want someone to get some experience under their belt before they're professionally advising you. 
um, about how to see things. So even though they're just as valid, people with different degrees are just as valid, having that experience in that MSW degree on top of that combination is what our profession has determined is the best combination and equip someone to provide you supervision in a useful way. Yes. We'll go here first, and there second. Yes. Okay. Um, I think, let's see. Well, I, I'm, um, I feel so busy to care for them. Okay. And um, I'm working under a lady who I'd probably read the name, but uh, Bell with Jennifer more than anybody. Um, I'm wondering if she's That might be licensing related. Questions like that, I would encourage you to try to sort those out your block week and field and ask questions. Make it a part of report, report building. I mean, I'm definitely not going to remember our over 300 field instructors necessarily put their requirements so on. It, 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 it could, it's not a license no, related? Year. Year. Our CSWE requirement referred to is an MSW with two years of most experience. That is not a license-related criteria. It's a, yeah. you got a master's degree. Just two years experience past. Criteria. So when yes. we're negotiating your field placement, guys, oh, there's fine. forms that we work with your individual we field sites on. So every field organization that you guys are placed at, we have to get a contractual agreement with. I've got to verify that they have an MSW degree. So there's lots of other steps that go into me securing your field sites for you outside of that. Yeah, yes. it, it becomes a very uh, complicated and intense process. And on the front, this is why we can't just let people pick their own or change or switch up because there's all this background stuff that has to be done in terms of accreditation, accreditation and credentialing that has to occur prior to you being put in a practicum. All right, yes, one last question. Okay, so if the student has um, a file with the uh, disabilities office, how does that affect the field placement experience? If they have a file with disability services, if we get the notice, it would, it would just depend on what uh, the request was for accommodation. I'm not really sure. I would probably need something more specific before I could, could answer that. Um, obviously, in the past, I, I've met, usually I get that. Um, and, if I ha and if I'm supposed to get something and I haven't got it, you may want to approach me individually at a later time after the training uh, to see uh, if there's anything I can do to assist in that. But a lot of times when people have had requests for accommodations, agencies are more than happy to provide that accommodation. It just becomes about whether or not you want to. Sometimes it might be more relevant for the classroom than it is for field or vice versa. So we can definitely attend to that on an individual basis. And we try to be sensitive to it, especially with me having worked at protection and advocacy for 12 years. I definitely try to be very respectful of, of rights, not just disability at all. Um, I think what we're going to do is I think we're going to try to go ahead and quickly let Jennifer get into some nuts and bolts before we break for lunch. And because I think that's going to answer actually a lot of the questions that you're asking um, are related to what she's going to talk about. So let's have her go ahead and come up and let's hold our questions and then when she is done, we'll take an hour break at that point. Um, yes. Sorry, but I have, I had some car, some car issues this morning and I have to wait for a couple of cars so I need to get my All right, well you can go now and get your car. No, I'm the last one to go before lunch. <laughs> so, nobody ever likes to be that person. I go right before lunch. That's not, that's not a fun person. All right, guys. I'm going to try and go through just some really nuts and bolts stuff with you guys. When you guys got the letter from our office confirming your field placement, you should have received the academic calendar for the year, the 2013-2014 academic calendar. Did they go over that yesterday, too? No, okay. Um, each of you should have received a copy of the 2013-2014 MSW academic calendar. It's got all the important dates that you'll need to know. It's in the front of your packet. It's conveniently located in the front of your packet. It says at the bottom. 
But there's just a couple dates that I wanted to go over with you guys really quick. Um, the official start date for classes for the university is tomorrow. Okay, so if you guys are taking traditional, and when I say traditional, what I mean is Columbia classes 9 to 12, 1 to 4. You guys do not have those classes next week during your block, which is August 26th through 30th. And if you guys are taking Saturday classes, an evening class, meaning after 5 p.m., or an online class, they will start this Thursday. Okay. Any questions about that? Yes. Does that include Charleston? So like tomorrow I have a class at night in Charleston and I go to that class? Yes. If you have an evening class in Charleston that starts Thursday, it will start tomorrow. Okay. So I leave Columbia and I like go straight to class. Yep. Yes. Okay. You would just leave here and go straight to class. Okay. Your professors and instructors are all aware that you guys are here at orientation. Um, you know, so obviously I'm assuming it's the first class, you guys are going over syllabi, getting to know each other, doing an awesome icebreaker, I'm sure. So um, hopefully you guys will get a little bit of leeway. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my, the, the question was, um, you know, I have an evening class here in Columbia, but I'm doing my field placement at a different location. Um, obviously, your field instructor and, and none of us here in the field education office can ever authorize you guys skipping class. Okay, so that's something you would need to negotiate with your field instructor. You would just need to let them know that there's a schedule conflict, that's your first day of class, and see what you can negotiate to maybe make up the day um, in a different format during the semester. Uh, but we will never give permission to skip class. Yes. For foundation students, is the traditional 9 to 12, 1 to 4. Any other format for class, an evening class, a Saturday class, an online class, hybrid class, whatever we're offering nowadays, you guys have class. And like I said, if you guys have a question, contact your individual instructor. Email them, call them, say, when is my official start date for class? And instructors have that ability to, to change start dates. So like I said, we have a ton of faculty, a ton of adjunct faculty. I wouldn't even begin to start telling you everybody's individual schedules. So take the initiative, contact your faculty if you have any concerns, okay? How many of you guys came from an undergraduate university that had fall break? Yeah. Ooh, that's some hands, okay. Um, I'm from New England, so fall break is pretty foreign to me. Uh, I was just used to one break in the spring. It's pretty great. So you guys actually get two breaks here. You get one in the fall. Your fall break is October 17th through the 19th. Your spring break is March 9th through the 16th. So technically, and I get a ton of questions about this, so I'm, I'm really hoping not to get to individual questions that are agency student specific. But here's the rule of thumb, guys. If the university is closed, meaning it's fall break, spring break, or a holiday, then you're not expected to be in field, okay? You want to go to field, and your field instructor is offering you to come in that day, that's fine, but it's not technically considered a field day. Now, when you guys get into field, you're gonna figure out really quickly that your field organization is gonna adhere to and abide by different holidays. You know, they may take Columbus Day, and you know, they may take Veterans Day, where, huh? Um, so you guys need to figure out if it's technically a day you were supposed to be in field, right? But the agency's closed, you can't go, right? So you guys need to map this out ahead of time. Be proactive. Nobody wants to get to the end of the semester and go, oops, three days short, okay? Sit down, ask them for their calendar for the whole year. They'll have it, they can get it from HR, they can give it to you. Map it out, guys. Uh, Dr. Reichmeyer just brought up a really good point. Uh, we have this happen every year, too. You, how many of you guys are doing field placement in a school? Okay. <coughs> Do you get two spring breaks? Yeah? No. No. That'd be fun. Um, no. 
because basically, if you're in a school system, their spring break's never going to line up with ours, guys, okay? So you really need to negotiate with your individual film instructor um, how you're going to negotiate that, because obviously you need to be there when the children are, you know, the children and the adolescents are there at the school, so we can't take two spring breaks. Any other questions about that? Okay. We have a set number of hours for every foundation student per field. It's non-negotiable. Okay? We have start dates and end dates per field and a set number of hours. You guys are technically starting field August 26th, next Monday. The last day of field for the fall semester is Friday, December 13th. Okay? Between those two dates, you guys need to have completed 240 hours in your field practice. Now that is based on doing your full 40 hour block week and doing your traditional two days week. Okay. Now I, I am not going to get into specific questions because I'm sure a lot of you in here have negotiated individual schedules. You may be doing four days a week, four hours a time. Uh, if you're in the ER, you may be doing a 12 hour shift. So it's okay if you individually negotiate your schedule with your field site. What matters is that you're starting on time and you're ending on time. And during that time frame, you get to the completed number of hours. Is there a hand? Technically, you guys aren't supposed to start foundation field until you come here for orientation. Now, many of you guys have probably gone into field for some orientations and required trainings. That's fine. That'll count. That'll count towards your field hours. Um, you guys can all give Dr. Reitmeyer a big thank you because being here today counts for field hours. And tomorrow. A little bit louder, guys. That's too big. lunch break and how you count your hours for the agency. Basically, you guys need to abide by whatever policies they have. So if your organization does a half hour lunch, you're getting a half hour lunch, okay? And you're not going to count the half hour you're at lunch. Some of you guys may go to a field organization that has a mandatory required hour long lunch. And you may say to your field instructor, like, hey, is it okay if I just use a half hour? And then, you know, eat my lunch here because I packed my own lunch. And then I you know, count that extra half hour, it's fine. Uh, basically, rule of thumb, guys, when it comes to time, clarify, clarify, clarify. It's not up to us. We set a number of hours and we start with start dates and end dates. Everything in between is negotiated directly with your field instructor. Okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so you guys aren't deciding this for the time or building our field and just my no. Um, the question was, do we set the time you guys are supposed to be at field? No. If you, how many of you in here don't know what time you're supposed to be there Monday morning? Okay, does anybody in here have a recommendation of what they should do? Call. Call or email their field instructor. We're problem solving as we go. get on the phone, you know, send some emails, get that clarified. Okay, I don't want anybody in here to have any kind of anxiety over the weekend. I want everybody just to relax because believe me, once this gets started, you will be busy. Okay? Question? Um, for the last week, it was at 9.30 and then all the last week, just That's a 
great question. On the calendar, it says the last week of field for the fall semester is December 9th through the 13th. That is not an additional block week. It just means that if your traditional field days were Wednesday and Thursday, that Thursday would be your last day of field for the semester. But as the students independently negotiate schedules, we set the entire week as the last week for field. Okay? Your individual instructors will set their exam schedules and their end dates, so you'll have to consult with them individually. Great question. In your packet, you guys should have a copy, of, a hard copy of all the forms, because we're going to be referencing them today. But um, did they go over Blackboard with you guys yesterday? Okay. Good. Everybody will have a Blackboard for their registered field course, which is 781. And in your Blackboard, Dr. Reckmeyer will upload all of the forms, so you can have them electronically. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, Hours spent in orientation, um, if we've already done that, does that apply to the block week or do we get to disperse that throughout the semester or how does that work? If you've already accrued hours doing mandatory or required trainings, you need to independently negotiate that with your field instructor. I can't authorize you guys to just comp out block week. Okay, so you really need to say to them, I'm going to have some extra hours if I do this full block week because I already came in in June to do X, Y, and Z. How would it work out better for you. Yeah, or you can save them for the the flu, my car broke down, my community papers do my 30 page 732 papers due tomorrow. Yes, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Great question. Great question. If I have extra hours from fall, do they roll the spring? The answer is yes. If 